Hey, and welcome back to another episode in our Intro to Music Tech series. I'm Dr. Brandon Vaccaro. I'm an Associate Teaching Professor of Music at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. This is going to be the second episode in our music notation portion of this course. So today what we're going to do is we're going to start with a Bach chorale that looks very similar, though it's not the same chorale as the one that you are tasked with using for your first assignment. In this case, I'm uh, simply finding this chorale Corral at bachcorrals.com, so shout out to them. Um, great resource that has all of these corrals. So there's a couple of things that we want to look at first. Um, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that on the page, we have a four voice corral texture and we would see soprano, alto in the upper in the treble clef, and those are indicated with up stems and down stems. We see bass and tenor in the bass clef, and again, those are indicated with up stems and down stems. We want to maintain this same format for the uh, assignment that we're going to do. So we're going to need to learn how to do these up stems and down stems. In finale, we're going to do this with a tool called layers, and that will allow us to create these multiple layers. We also want to notice that there is text underneath all of this. We're going to need to put the text in. We also want to think a little bit about some of the extra notation that's happening here. For example, the fermatas that are used to indicate the end of the phrases in box corral. And uh, we're going to do at least a small portion of this. We're not going to do the whole thing. Obviously, we're mainly going to use this just as a bit of a platform so that we can explore some of the tools that you'll need for this upcoming assignment. The other thing I want to take note of is I want to take a moment and I want to look at this piece of music and I want to maybe identify a few things about it. So I see that we start with a D minor chord and I see that the first cadence is also ending with a D minor chord with a 4-3 suspension with actually a little bit of ornamentation, so a 4-3 suspension and retardation going into the third of the chord. However, you notice we don't have a key signature. And this is actually um, something that does happen in box era. We tend to think of, chord, of key signatures as being something that's fairly standardized by the late Baroque, but of course that isn't really the case. So what we're seeing is definitely a piece in D minor. However, rather than notating it with the, the typical D minor key signature, which would be one flat, we can see that they're simply adding the flats. And we can see a C sharp here. That's a pretty good confirmation that we are in D minor. We're seeing the raised seventh of the harmonic or potentially the melodic, ascending melodic D minor scale. So in any case, we're going to respect the, uh, the nature of this. Actually, we may take a moment and we'll look at what this would look like if we put this in D minor, um, but for at least the purposes of the video, we're going to keep it pretty close to what we're seeing on the screen. So I am, uh, as I've mentioned in the previous video, I'm a Finale user. I've used Finale for years, so I'm going to do this first demo in Finale. Again, that's not an indication that you need to use Finale for your assignment. Any of the notation software platforms that we talked about at the end of the last video would be more than acceptable and more than capable of doing this assignment. As always with this course, we're generally pretty platform agnostic. We're more interested in the output rather than necessarily the tool we used. Obviously, again, if you're an SRT major, I've mentioned this many times, we will have specific software that we're going to have you learn in our classes as we move forward through the curriculum. But for this first Intro to Music Tech course, the important thing is just to get comfortable with utilizing technology to accomplish these goals so that you'll be able to hand in your assignments in future music courses throughout your music studies. So I am going to go ahead and bring up Finale, and the first thing that we see in Finale is we get a launch window, and there's a couple of options that we could use for this. So for the first part of this, we're going to go ahead and use the setup wizard because that is, of course, the easiest way to set up a document. However, we will take a little bit of time, um, maybe in a future video, and go back and show how we would set this up from scratch if we needed to. So I'm going to start by going to setup wizard. It's going to give me an option to, first off, potentially create a new ensemble or use some of the existing ensembles. I also see that there's a couple of selected document styles, one that's the engraved style, one that's the handwritten style. As we'll see in some future videos, we're going to use engraved style in this video. However, if we do another video and I do something more jazz-oriented that's designed to look like the real books, we'll use the handwritten style. That is pretty typical for that style. So I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to scroll through here and and see if they have 
an ensemble that looks like close to what I need, and it looks like they do not. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new ensemble type, and we'll work through that in the next screen. I'm also gonna take a moment, and in this case, I'm eight and a half by 11 is fine. You notice that they do give us some other page styles here. I know I mentioned previously in one of the previous videos um, that we often do parts when we're doing orchestral or wind ensemble music. The long-standing tradition has been in the professional orchestra world that we actually either use this nine by 12, or actually pretty commonly, it's a 10 by 13 in the orchestral world. Um, I've been told wind ensemble directors have gotten increasingly comfortable with eight and a half by 11 because they're often having to photocopy parts to distribute them to players. Um, so in any case, for our purposes, eight and a half by 11 is gonna be fine. Obviously, if we were thinking about somebody reading this stuff on an iPad, we might actually wanna think about the page format that's gonna most correctly match the proportions on an iPad if somebody is using like four score or some other kind of software notation to play back on stage. I think again, I mentioned in a previous video, that's become increasingly common for solo and ensemble music. I think for the large ensembles, you don't really see that very often, at least when I go to major symphony orchestras, I'm certainly not seeing them playing from iPads. But again, for chamber music, I think that has become increasingly common. And it does save, uh, obviously, there's a little less environmental impact in terms of having to print the paper. Um, but it also saves the composer potential costs for having to duplicate those large and unusual sized pages like a 12 by uh, 12 by, uh, sorry, a 9 by 12 or a 10 by 13. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the next button. That's going to take me onto the next screen. And this gives me the option for how I want to handle this. So for example, I can go under any of the various headings here and find that there are some options here. As I look under voices, we could go soprano voice, alto voice, tenor voice, bass voice, but that's going to give us four separate staves. And you'll remember what we wanted to do was more like a chorale type voicing. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and pick voice with no staff name. We don't need to add a staff name because as we can see on the corral, that's not indicated. We don't have an instrument name indicated here. So I'm going to choose two of those. You'll notice they give me an option for score order. In this case, it's not gonna make a difference because I have two instruments and neither of them are typical for the ensemble types that we see. But we have um, some standard ensemble types that have different score orders. For example, the orchestral score, one of the biggest differences is we would expect to see the horns at the top of the brass section. In a wind ensemble or concert band, we would expect to see the trumpets above the horns. There's little things like that that Finale can help you format right off the bat. And again, we can always customize and make our own custom score order. In this case, I'm not going to worry about it because those two options, um, not, neither of them really fit in with an orchestra or an ensemble or anything like that. Now, if I was creating a standard, uh, a non-standard ensemble type for which I write a lot, I might want to save this as a new ensemble so that the next time I'm writing for this ensemble, I don't have to create a new, um, a new uh, ensemble type for it. But in this case, again, I'm going to go ahead and stick with uh, just leaving that as is. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next page, and this is where I want to go ahead and prep a little bit of my document. So in this case, I'm going to throw on a title. Obviously, um, normally we would probably pick the title of the chorale. I'm not really going to worry too much about this. I will just call it Bach BWV 276. I'm going to leave the subtitle off, and I'm going to list this as J.S. Bach for my composer. There won't be any copyright on this. So I'm going to preemptively, I know I'm going to have to take off the copyright indication at the bottom of the page, but remember Bach is public domain. Obviously he's been dead for quite some time now, so we don't need to worry about his music being copyrighted. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that so that if I forget to take the copyright indication off at the bottom of the page where it's regularly put by the, the default document wizard setup, then I don't have to worry about that having just a random floating copyright symbol. So I'm going to go to the next page. Now I'm going to start thinking about the document that I'm setting up. So in this case, we're referencing uh, the, the page that we see here. This is in 4.4. And again, this is where I would set the key signature. Now, typically, I might set this to D minor. But again, in this case, we're going to respect the original notation of the Bach chorale. 
which notated this in as if it were an A minor. Um, now, to save myself some trouble, I in the assignment, we're doing something a bit non-traditional, which is we're adding some tempo markings and other markings that typically wouldn't be there in box music. So I'm going to go ahead and specify an initial tempo marking. And I haven't decided what tempo I want this to be yet, so I'm just going to give myself a placeholder. But this will allow me to create a tempo indication with both a text indication as well as a metronome marking. Again, this wouldn't be typical in box period, so we don't see any kind of tempo indication here. But for our purposes, just to familiarize ourselves with the notation software, we are going to go ahead and utilize this feature. We also notice that there is a one quarter note pickup measure. So I'm going to go ahead and set that up now. Give myself that one quarter pickup measure. And if I wanted to, I could go through and count the number of measures and save myself the time of having to add and delete measures. 26, 27, 28, 29. So we need 29 measures. And I'm going to go ahead and finish. And hopefully that should go ahead and give me my empty document. So a couple of things we want to notice. I am working on a Macintosh. So a couple of things that are going to be different in the Windows platform. Finale opens everything in one window, and then these are what are called palettes within that one window. On the Mac platform, it opens as separate windows that are all kind of floating in parallel. However, um, Again, it's basically the same tool set. It's just a question of how it appears on the screen. So I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to familiarize myself and you with a couple of features in Finale. So we have the main tool palette in Finale, and this is where we get access to most of the main tools. Probably one of the more challenging things if we're learning Finale is that there are a lot of different tool sets, and consequently we need to know which tool we need to go in to do specific things. And this isn't, to be honest, it's not always the most intuitive thing. In some cases, we can guess from the glyph that they give us, the, the graphic indication, what sort of things might be happening. And of course, if I hover over it, generally it will tell me what the chord or what the tool name is. Sorry, I'm reading chord tool. and uh, It will tell me what that palette is and what it controls. So I'm going to go ahead and take a moment and move everything over so that I can see what we're working with here in the screen. And we're going to start, and I'm going to enter a couple of notes with the simplest and easiest way. Uh, no pun intended, this is called simple note entry. So you notice I have a palette here, and if I can, I can access that by clicking on the note that doesn't have a uh, little graph line. There's another thing we'll explore in a minute called speedy note entry in just a moment, but for the time being, we're going to go ahead and use regular notes. So I know the first note in my top voice, in the soprano voice, is a quarter note on the note A. So I'm simply going to select that, move over, and boom, I've got that note. Now, I'd like to add the F natural in the alto voice, but I want that to be downstemmed. So I'm going to go to layer two. This is in the lower left side of this. And go ahead and enter my F. And you notice because layer one is um, above layer two, it upstemmed layer one, and it will always upstem layer one. Even if I had a voice crossing, layer one would continue to be upstemmed. So I want to make sure that I'm always putting the soprano note into layer one. I want to put the alto note into layer two. Similarly, in the uh, in the bass clef, I want to make sure that I put the bass voice in layer two and the tenor voice in layer one. And that'll solve my stemming problems. I don't have to go back and do any work to get those to upstem and downstem correctly. So again, within Finale, layering is the cleanest, easiest way to maintain this multi-voice texture. So I'm gonna continue on for a moment here. I'm gonna go back to layer one, and again, I'll enter a couple of more notes with simple note entry. So next note is gonna be a G, then I need to switch over to eighth notes. I'm going to go to A, B, now I need a quarter note again, C, D, and then I'm going to come back down to A. And I'm going to finish out that next measure, otherwise if I don't, Finale will tend to want to put rests in that measure, at least uh, with speedy note entry it does, so out of habit, I'm just going to go ahead and finish the whole measure even though it's... Uh, 
a new phrase that's starting in that next measure. Oh. So I uh, made a mistake. Again, if I needed to, if I wanted to erase a note, I could go back and use the eraser tool to erase that. So um, you notice in some cases we do have some downstems. Because there is no second voice in this first complete measure, Finale is assuming that we should use regular stemming practices. And when we're below the B line, we are using up stems. From the B line up, we're using down stems. Of course, we know the B line can also be up stemmed if it's attached to a note that is down stemmed. So you notice the A, B here, those are both up stemmed. However, as soon as I put something in layer two, it's gonna up stem all of the soprano notes. So I need to go back to eighth notes, make sure I'm in eighth notes, and I wanna add an F, an E, an E, G, and in a moment we'll look at how to break that stem so that it will match what's what our reference shows. Um, incidentally, there's a dot. If I need to add a dot to a note, I simply select the note value, select the dot, and that gives me a dotted note. If I need to turn it off, I just select the note again. So I need to go back to an eighth note, and we're going to go to G. Now, we want to make sure we don't forget the G-sharp in order to do that. I'm going to go ahead and select the sharp. I'm going to go back to my G. I'm going to select a G-sharp. And you notice it gave me the courtesy accidental. In fact, it's not really a courtesy accidental. It's necessary because we need to cancel out the G-sharp before we go into the next measure. And if I wanted to keep going with this, I uh, can now get rid of the sharp. Add a G in the next note. Select tie to tie those two notes together. You notice that finale now filled in rests in the rest of that measure. As I mentioned, that's one of those things that's sometimes a bit of a pain. So I tend to try and fill out an entire measure before I go on just to avoid having to go back and delete those notes. Down and get my D. All right, so now I've gotten through those measures. Again, I would keep going and fill all this out, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop right now and I'm gonna go ahead and drop into the lower voices, into the, the tenor and the bass. And the first thing we notice is that I have the wrong clef. So I do need to take a moment and I'm gonna go ahead and use the clef tool. And you notice they give us a full array of clefs. In our case, we just need treble and bass. So you notice that it's giving us this number sign before measure one. That's indicating that it's not a full measure, that that's actually a pickup measure. Remember that we, has, that we normally do not count the first incomplete measure as measure number one. We would count measure number one for the first complete measure. So the number sign is simply showing me that uh, this is starting from the very beginning of the piece. And we change that, boom, now we're good. So once again, I can go through the same process. I wanna switch back to layer one and do my tenor voice. Let's start out with some eighth notes. So um, you can see this gets a little tedious because I have to keep going up to the simple note palette. I also have a rest palette over here if I needed to add rests anywhere. Um, but to demonstrate another tool, I'm going to show you the speedy note tool. So speedy note tool functions a little differently. And the way it works is we're going to use a combination of a MIDI keyboard and the number pad on the QWERTY keyboard. So basically the way this works is the number five is a quarter note. So I know the next note that I need is a B, I need it to be a quarter note. So I've held down with my left hand, I've held down the B on a MIDI keyboard in front of me. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to the camera. So down below me, I have this little MIDI keyboard living on my little keyboard tray right here. So I'm holding the correct note, and then I simply press the number five on my QWERTY keyboard, and that gives me 
the correct note value. If I go, if I want to go to eighth notes, I go to four. If I want to go to half notes, I go to six. And all of the various note values scale up and down from that. So this can be a much quicker way to work through this kind of material. So I'm going to keep going through this measure and go ahead and do my C, D, E. Now I'm going to go to the number three to do the 16th notes. And that gets me through that measure. Now you notice the spacing looks a little wonky. It's going to auto space as soon as I come out of this. So as soon as I go into another tool, it'll auto space that and it'll start looking a little, little better. Now, one of the things that we do want to know is that um, we generally do expect that we have to go back and re-space and lay out our pages appropriately. For example, you can see it looks like there may be a few more measures on the page in our page layout and scaling and is a little different than what what we see on the, the document that we're referencing. So this will be something that we'll fix and change later on. While I'm in speedy note entry, I also want to go ahead and take a moment. I'm going to go back to layer two. I'm going to fix this beaming problem here. And in speedy note entry, there's a shortcut to do this. Um, there are, of course, other ways to do this, but one of the easiest ways we can do this is by pressing the slash key on the number pad to split a beam. So I uh, have corrected that alto issue. So looking now at the base part, I'm going to stay in speedy note entry. I'm going to go ahead and go down and I'm going to make sure I'm in layer two so that I can do the second voice. And I'm going to go ahead and going to actually shift the octave on my keyboard just so that I can be in the right register. So there's my D. Now, um, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and go up to the E with an eighth note, and then I'm simply going to press the period key on the number pad, and it will dot the previous note. And again, I need to add a sixteenth note. I'm going to switch back and do eighth notes. In this case, I'm going to add the B flat. It will automatically make it a B flat. So you notice it did correctly um, determine from the context that B flat was the far more likely note. Sometimes you get lucky with this. Sometimes finale will pick the wrong accidental. Obviously, we can go back and do inharmonic flips if we need to. In this case, we ended up with the correct note. So I'm going to keep moving on. Make sure I dot that note. And then I'm going to go ahead and add the C to finish out that measure. And uh, just for, because I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead and keep going so I can just, for my uh, personal satisfaction, get through the rest of this. And again, it did pick the correct accidental for the C sharp. All right, so now I'm gonna go back, finish out my tenor voice, and that'll give me the first two full measures completed. So to again shift my MIDI keyboard so that it's in the right octave. And you notice I picked a quarter note accidentally rather than a half note. I can just use the arrow keys on the keyboard. I'm going to move back and hit the correct note value and it changes it. All right, so that gets me through those first couple of measures. And if I switch out of that tool, you notice it tries to respace everything. And again, that's something that we will go back and clean up at the uh, end of our project. We will go back and handle some spacing. So a um, couple other things that I want to think about. At this point, I need to add some fermatas to these layers. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the tool that has my fermatas, which in this case is a tool called the articulation tool. So I'm going to select the articulation tool and I'm going to go to the note. I'm going to make sure that I'm in the correct layer. I want this to be on the upstemmed layer. So I'm going to go to the A. I'm going to select that and it gives me the articulation selection. Simply go and find the fermata. Incidentally, it does show me that if I held down the F key while I clicked on that note, it would have made a fermata for me. So that gives me a fermata there. To get the downstemmed version on the alto voice, I'm going to switch to layer two for the alto voice. And this time I am going to go ahead and use that keyboard shortcut. And you notice because I added it to layer two, it correctly put it on the bottom and flipped it upside down. This gives you an idea of at least the, the kind of handful of tool sets that we might use.
The next thing I'm gonna think about is adding lyrics. And one of the things I notice as soon as I think about adding lyrics is that in this case, uh, for a four part chorale, they are going between the two staves. And when we look over at the, the our copy of it, we see that these staves are much too close. So I'm gonna go ahead and respace those. I'm gonna to go to the staff tool and then I'm gonna go up under the staff menu and I wanna draw your attention to a feature of Finale, which is when I change tools, it does change what menus are available. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the staff tool and I'm gonna to go to respace staves. And then let's maybe try and go 130%. It's getting closer, but not quite. We would have some collisions with the text eventually hitting that. So let's maybe go up by another 10%. All right, so that gets me my spacing for at least the first system. And we'll go through and address the other systems in our layout as we need to. For Finale, we do have something called the Lyric Tool, and that's gonna be the easiest way for us to add our text to the music. So I'm gonna select the Lyric Tool. It's a bizarre looking glyph that I assume is some kind of pen, maybe in a pen holder, who really knows? So we select that, and I wanna make sure I'm in layer one because I wanna notice that the melismas, the places where a single syllable is covering multiple notes, happens most consistently align with the soprano voice. So I'm gonna use that as my reference and I'm gonna make sure I'm pointed towards that. I'm gonna double click. And then I'm gonna start typing my text. To move on to the next note, I simply pressed the space bar. Now, I'm gonna add a dash and that's gonna move the note and allow me to get to the next note. All right, so now I've got my text and of course I can go back and play with the alignment if I need to. Again, I want to avoid any collisions. I want this to be legible and readable. And once again, I could keep going with this. You notice that it did add those dashes in roughly the correct location. So this is starting to look remarkably like our reference here. In the assignment, again, this is not something we would expect to see in box music. We don't see, especially in the four-part chorales, we don't see dynamics. We generally don't see articulations other than the fermata, um, but we are going to go ahead and add some of these things, maybe even some hairpins or slurs, um, some things just to give us an opportunity to explore these tools that are available in Finale. And, uh, in Finale in this case and in whatever notation software you're using. The important thing to remember is, again, this is not something that's gonna be in the music itself, so we need to make some reasonable guesses. So for example, I can go into my, um, my expression tool and I'm gonna go ahead and add a dynamic to this. Now, generally, dynamics go below a musical instrument part. So normally we would expect to see the dynamics below the part. However, vocal music is an exception to that. And because we generally have text below the vocal part, the tradition is that we would put a dynamic above. So if I double click, it brings up the expression guide and it gives me an option for a whole bunch of existing expressions. I can even create my own if I need to. In this case, I'm gonna make a decision. I'm gonna make a bold decision that we're gonna use the dynamic of piano. And notice it defaulted to its position, putting it below the staff. I'm gonna drag this up above and dynamics are properly aligned with the note to which they apply. So I want to make sure it applies there. Incidentally, tempo markings are also of the same tool. So you notice as soon as I selected that, there was a handle in the placeholder. So let's say that I decided I wanted to change that tempo to something other than placeholder. Decided I wanted to be moderate and let's maybe set this to We'll call 82 moderate. 
so I can go back and change those. One thing that I do wanna glance down at, or glance over at rather, is to look over on playback and see if it set this, it did. So if I wanted to use the playback feature, I would wanna redefine this tempo to what it says on the page, otherwise it would be confusing that we're looking at quarter note equals 82, but when you play it back, it would play back at 120. Again, you notice we have some tabs up here. We have main, we have playback, we have positioning. In our case, we're gonna go ahead and change the playback to that and so we've now updated that with an actual tempo marking. Again, we wouldn't expect to see a tempo marking in box corrals, nor would we expect to see a dynamic marking, but for our purposes of learning the software, we are going to go ahead and make use of that. Let's also decide that I might wanna have some type of dynamic shaping, like a, a hairpin crescendo. And in this case, I might pick the crescendo tool, and I'm gonna put this up here drag it over for the duration. Maybe I decide I want that first phrase to crescendo. Now I wanna take a second, I'm gonna go back to this tool, and I wanna make sure that it's not colliding with anything. If it were, I can come back and I can actually select the little handle in the middle of it, and then use the up, up tool, up arrow rather, on the keyboard to nudge it up a little bit out of the way. So now I've got a crescendo going into that fermata, gives us a little bit of shape. Again, I'm not making good musical decisions here. Obviously, we would want to make informed decisions about the dynamics, all of these kind of things that we would put in here. In this case, I'm uh, just trying to demonstrate the tools again, and for the purposes of our assignment, that's what we're really focused on. Let's say I had reached a point where I've got some music entered, and I've mentioned a few times that I might want to play with the spacing. So one of the things that I might want to do is come over here, the measure tool, and I'm gonna hit the down arrow to move that onto the next system because maybe I've decided I want a little more generous spacing up here. So you notice that gives me a lock up here which shows this system is now locked and that spacing will be respected. So let's say I finished out the last measure, it's gonna auto space, that's gonna give me a nice, clear, easy to read layout. One of the things that we wanna think about when we're doing music notation software is the legibility of it. We want this to be easy to be read by performers. Again, I might go through and if I were gonna finish out the next measure, I could finish out all those details and I would keep chipping away through this assignment. I believe those are the main things that I've asked you to do on this assignment. In this case, um, you might consider adding your name to the arranger so that your name would be on your assignment. Obviously, we'd also wanna save this using the naming protocol we use in class. To change these text bullets here, or these text entries here that were generated by default. Um, I'm going to go into the text tool, which is just a font. And let's say I wanted to get rid of my subtitle. I can select that and delete it, or rather backspace it. If I wanted to change the arranger, I can go in and change that to my name. And I mentioned that there would be a rogue copyright indication at the bottom of the page because I erased the text from it. If I printed it, that wouldn't show up. But let's go ahead and get rid of it anyways. So last few things that I might want to think about in terms of laying this out is I might want to think about the layout between these um, systems. For example, I might go to Edit Margins. And um, just to be clear, I selected the Page Layout tool. I went to edit margins and let's say I wanted to change the layout between that. So starting after the first staff or the first system, you can see here the first system is indented by a half an inch. I don't want to copy that to the other ones. Um, though in our case, we actually, because we don't have a name on these parts, we could actually get rid of that indentation. That indentation is normally there because we would have the name for the part there. So let's go ahead and I'll get rid of that. So that gives me a little more consistent spacing and because I don't really need a name on that staff, I can keep that how it is. And then I'm gonna to go to the second system and I'm gonna add a bit more space between the systems. So I'll change this to 0.5 and I'm gonna delete the last number in the range, which will basically do this to the rest of the document. And you notice that gives me a little more, a little better spacing across the entire page. So now that's looking a little cleaner. I'm gonna to have to go back and play with that because of course I need to respace re my staves on the other systems. 
Let's see where this original one, I ended up at 1.43 there. Try and keep that roughly that same spacing. And I might go back and play with this to get this to all fit on one page. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and go back. And I'm gonna go back to edit margins. And I'm gonna take this down to 0.4 and see if that gets me everything back on one page. Not quite. And let's see if after we respace this bottom one, if it still fits. It does not. So we'll go back and adjust our layout tool one more time. Once again, with page layout, we'll take this down to point three. Oop, make sure it applies to all of them. Yeah, let's go back to point two five, and boom, we've got it all on one page. So this would give me the ability to get the whole corral on one page, assuming that we didn't have chain layouts. Obviously, as soon as I start entering notes, I would end up with a lot fewer measures in these. So um, this just gives you an idea of how we use the layout tools to start to get things laid out on the page. A couple other things that we do run into sometimes with Finale, um, again, if I needed to do slurring, my slurring tool is going to be within the uh, Shapes tool. I've got my Crescendo and Diminuendo, we've got Trills, we've got the Trill Extension tool, which will give us a little wavy line, we've got the Alatava Indication, um, which is often abbreviated as 8VA or 8VB. Technically, it's Alatava and generally um, Alatava Basso. We have the Quintadecima, which is the two octaves above or below. We also have some brackets, braces, things like that. We have a uh, kind of a wavy glissando tool that we can use. We have a guitar bend tool. Um, we have a gliss or tab slide tool. So there's a couple of different shapes that they have set up for us in here. Uh, if we were doing jazz work, we may need to make use of the chord tool, which would give me the ability to give a chord indication above the notation. So that might be something we would do for a lead sheet where I would have the melody notated here and I would have chords indicated as they chord change, as the chords change throughout the piece. Um, we have accents and articulations. Again, we use that for the fermata, but let's go in and look a little more at what is in the uh, articulation tool. I'm just gonna pick a random note here, but this is where we would get our staccatos, our marcados, um, our tenuto with a staccato, our traditional accents, all of the various types of marcado and accent indications, fingerings, uh, an additional place that we can use trills, as well as trills that have the uh, chromatic alterations. Our measured and unmeasured tremolo indications, pedal indications for the piano, and various other glyph notations that might be used for things like percussion and other notation styles. And again, all of these we can create our own, import graphics, all kinds of options with Finale. For our purposes, this should get us through what we need to do, and hopefully that will get you working on your assignment. Now, let's say you don't want to work in Finale. Well, let's say you decide you want to work in Sibelius or MuseScore or any of the other options. I guarantee you all of them have the facility to do the things that we've been looking at in terms of Finale. And how am I going to find those things? Well, throughout the semester, one of the things we've reminded you is that all of these companies provide ample support documentation. So in Finale, if I go back in and I'm, let's say I'm confused and I can't remember how to do something. I can't remember how to unlock systems here. So I'm going to go to Help. And you notice they have a quick reference guide, they have tutorials, they have quick start videos, and they have a user manual. I'm gonna bring up the user manual. In this case, it launches on my launches in my browser. And let's look up unlock. And it gives me the option to do keyboard shortcuts. I can see Command Shift U. 
updates layout and unlocks all systems. If I see down here in the utilities menu, command shift U or with the selection tool selected, press U to unlock systems. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to finale. I'm gonna grab my selection tool. I'm gonna select the place I wanna unlock and I'm just gonna press U to unlock it. So now I have my first system locked, but I have unlocked my second system. A few other things you notice, Finale by default adds measure numbers, um, and they do that at the beginning of each system. However, uh, it's pretty common that we might want to add rehearsal numbers to a piece that we're working on, rehearsal letters or rehearsal numbers. Um, in the old days, it seemed like it was pretty common that people like to use rehearsal letters. These days, that I think, in my opinion, um, has kind of gotten out of vogue, and part of the reason is because it's a pain to deal with if you realize you need to get, go back and add a new rehearsal letter, that you have to re-letter everything after that. So quite often, we just box the measure number. But let's say at measure five, I decided I wanted to put a rehearsal number. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go to rehearsal marks. It gives me the option for rehearsal letters or rehearsal, yeah, for letters here. Then I, it gives me also options for measure numbers. So I'm going to select that. Boom, it gives me rehearsal number five at measure number five. Again, that saves us time if we were in rehearsal and the conductor didn't want to have to count ev everybody counting measures. They can pick a rehearsal location that we've indicated because we know as we wrote the piece, that would be a reasonable place that as we were rehearsing with an ensemble that we might choose to start a particular run through. So if I know measure five is a good place to start, I could give a rehearsal number there. That way nobody has to count measures and go four, five, six, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, that's where measure eight is. I can just give them an eight indicated in the actual part, whereas my measure numbers were back here. Lots of good options, lots of interesting things that we can do for the purposes of this first assignment. This will at least run you through the tools. Once again, in any of the other platforms that we're working with, if you're working in Sibelius or another platform, make use of the manual make use of some tutorial videos, whatever is going to be helpful to get going. The important thing is that we want to make the uh, music look as good as possible. We want to make sure we've addressed issues with collisions. A collision, by the way, is when we have two things that end up on top of each other. So for example, let's say I were to add an articulation to the top of this note, to layer one. Let's say I wanted to add an accent. And you notice it ended up right smack dab in the middle of that piano. Now, right now, you can almost kind of make it out. If I zoom in, you can kind of tell the difference, but that's because on the screen, we're seeing the um, dynamic indicated in green and the articulation is in black. When this gets printed, all of this color is gonna go away and this is just gonna become a, uh, a flat black document. And in all likelihood, the players would not see that accent or it might make it harder to read the dynamic. So in that case, I'd want to go back and make sure that I respace some things. So I might, for example, move my tempo indication up a little bit, select my dynamic, and use the arrow tool to just nudge that up a little bit until it's out of the way. This kind of attention to detail, making sure that we've addressed all of the collisions, that everything is the, the correct accidentals, correct note values, everything is readable, legible, all of that makes a huge difference when it comes time to put this material in front of musicians who have to perform this stuff. And after all, that's the purpose of notation, isn't it? The only reason we're going to notate this stuff in most real world situations is because we want to communicate how to perform this piece to other musicians so that they can perform the piece for us. And that's going to be true whether we're writing a piece for a chorale, whether we're writing an orchestral piece, a wind ensemble piece, or whether we're scoring a film and we're bringing in a handful of musicians to do recording sessions to overdub or sweeten parts that we've done with virtual instruments. So we want to take the time to get this stuff to look as clean as possible. It really does does matter. Um, I can't stress enough, getting good notation makes all the difference in the world in how, first off, how easy it is for performers to perform your music and indirectly how seriously they will take your music. So we're going to wrap up this video. Uh, we will pick up with another notation video in which we'll look at the next assignment and talk a little bit about some of the other features that we might see in Finale. Again, we uh, I brushed over some things like the handwritten font that gives us something that looks a little more like real books. Um, 
We obviously didn't deal with staff names. We haven't talked about transpositions or any of the other things that might come up in a more advanced situation. So we're going to do another video in the notation portion of our Intro to Music Tech series and come back with that. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode in our series.